everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have an exciting tour and uh, discussion planned for the next hour, hour and a half. So we hope you can stay with us the entire time. Um, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment and thank our sponsors with, um, without their assistance, none of this would be possible. So I wanna thank our platinum sponsors, SM Wilson and CD Companies. Our gold sponsors, McCarthy, Custom Engineering, Silver Sponsors, Castle, Magnetize, Lawrence Group, KWK Architects, Development Strategies, Civil Design Inc. Our bronze sponsors, Premier Design Group, Shannon and Wilson, Horner and Schifrin, and Ross and Berezini. And our in-kind sponsors are Hotel St. Louis, St. Louis Construction News and Review, JM Films, and Modern Litho. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, Megan, I appreciate that introduction. All right, so now that we're getting this event started, I just wanted to first start off by thanking all of our, our panelists today. We are so excited to be able to feature such an extraordinary project for St. Louis. For a man who needs no introduction, I'd like to start off by introducing Stephen Shankman. Steve founded Contemporary Productions in 1968 to book and promote concerts. Over the past uh, almost 50 years, Contemporary has produced over 22,000 concerts, special events, and marketing programs, including the Rolling Stones, U2, Billy Joel, Dolly Parton, Garth Brooks, Michael Bublé, and Jerry Seinfeld. Some of the company's most acclaimed events, including the Super Bowl halftime show with U2 in 2001, the Propel visit in 1999, and the St. Louis Cakewalk. After selling contemporary productions to what would eventually be known as Live Nation, Steve and his team started the next version of contemporary productions to produce entertainment, special events, and marketing programs. Steve credits his team of professionals for the success of contemporary productions and has always put customer satisfaction in his team at the top of most important components of a successful company. Contemporary is also known as the producer of many successful events for St. Louis companies, institutions, and charities. Next, we have Brian Karp, who is the COO of The Factory. Brian is a seasoned venue executive who brings decades of experience to the project. Brian has been instrumental in the design and development of The Factory. From the time Brian entered the industry, his focus has been on the guest and band experience at the venues he has operated. Those venues include the world famous Fox Theater in Boulder, Colorado, a venue named one of the top 10 clubs in the country by Rolling Stone during Brian's tenure at the facility. He went on to help merge the Fox Theater with the Boulder Theater and became the COO of Z2 Entertainment. Prior to relocating back to St. Louis, Brian oversaw operations of the House of Blues in Anaheim, California and the House of Blues in Dallas, Texas. Next, we have Dan Merker, who's the talent buyer at the factory and also works at Contemporary Productions. Dan has continued to innovate and lead the industry in pursuit of redefining concert produ uh, producing and artist touring. As a leading executive within the music and touring business over the past 10 years, Dan has led talent bookings and business dealings designed to guide new approaches to achieve long-term strategic artist partnerships with the goal of redistributing tour revenues transparently while creating elevated fan experiences. His well-rounded background in finance, production, and talent buying led him to play key roles in creating the Torguga Music Festival, which earned ACM's 2017 Festival of the Year under his leadership. Next, we have Jeff Jarrett, Senior Vice, Pre uh, Senior Vice President and Partner of Contemporary Productions, is an event producer and talent buyer with two decades of experience. He has represented global corporations and brands, music festivals, professional sports organizations, non-for-profits, private individual and governments to the entertainment industry. Since joining Contemporary in 2004, Jarrett has produced experiences and provided talent for thousands of major corporate non-for-profit, public and private events. His clients include the Walt Disney Company, Wells Fargo, Shell, Worldwide Technology, Facebook, Stiefel, Yeti Coolers, Anheuser-Busch, American Cancer Society, Major League Baseball, and Tropicana Entertainment in 2010. Jarrett was instrumental in developing Loot Fest, which has grew to become one of North America's most prominent music festivals. All right. Steve, I, before we get into the factory, I'd really like for you to give us some perspective on the St. Louis market 
you have done so much for the entertainment industry, especially here in St. Louis. So I thought I'd kick it off by letting you have the stage and just talk a little bit about contemporary productions and also a little bit about the St. Louis market and how you're making St. Louis number one in entertainment. Well, thank you very much for having me and my, my colleagues. Uh, actually, Jeff is celebrating 17 years with the company and so it's a big day here. Dan works out of Nashville. Uh, we've never had a presence in Nashville. Nashville is known as the third coast. So you have LA, New York, and Nashville. And it's great having them down there. Matter of fact, we're producing a show that will air tomorrow night for all zoos and aquariums in the country, our country, Canada, and abroad. And uh, with Dan's help, as well as Jeff, we were able to book everybody from Brad Paisley to Winona and with Old Dominion Song of the Year on the show as well. So if you want to help zoos out tomorrow, that's my commercial. Uh, tune on uh, tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Just go to STL Zoo or go to uh, 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 All Together for Animals and you'll be able to see for $30 an hour, 10 minute show, which is, I hate to say it since I was the executive producer, but I think it's fabulous. One of the best things we've ever done. So when I started in St. Louis uh, booking bands in the 60s, uh, I had my own band, uh, the Impact Soul Review, which is now the Fabulous Motown Review, which has been around for over 30 years. Probably played some of your daughter's weddings or parties for your company. Uh, I never knew that I was going to be in the concert business because in 1970, I was on my way to St. Louis U to go to law school. And I made a left turn and ended up at the Fox Theater and did The Grateful Dead in 1969, uh, which is well documented because that was the day, a few days after they were busted in New Orleans and they wrote the song Truckin'. And it was all about them coming to St. Louis to play the show that was my first show I ever booked. And as you mentioned, uh, since then, we've done about 22,000 shows. So we're 52 years old uh, this year, going on 53. Uh, if you figure that I started when I was 20, you'll know my age. Uh, St. Louis at the time was mostly uh, black shows. I mean, you saw Smokey and Aretha, which had that great special on uh, last week, which you should watch uh, on Hulu now. Uh, you know, and I played on The Temptations actually in the 1968, I think it was August the 2nd. It was the last night that David Ruffin sang lead after that, or, or also not with us anymore. Dennis Edwards became the lead singer and did uh, his first big song, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. But, uh, but St. Louis was a Passover city, uh, to pardon the pun, because it is Passover in the Jewish faith. Uh, people would go, acts would go to Chicago, uh, to Nashville or Memphis, on to Colorado. I mean, St. Louis was kind of a Passover city because it was not a major market. Part of the reason was we didn't have very good venues. If you all remember the old arena, which became the Checker Dome, uh, not a very good venue. Matter of fact, I would never let my kids sit in the first five rows because the ceiling uh, when we hung stuff and the rigging was bridled, which anybody that knows engineering knows that if something's being bridled from a wood ceiling, it's not very safe. So my son had to sit at least five rows back from the front. Anyway, we got out of there and the new Keel Center and things changed there. But we had Keel, we had the Opera House, we had the Checker Dome three not very good venues at the time, run down and not very good. And as new venues came online, things got better. And that's when you saw the Riverport Amphitheater, which I still call it. That was the name I gave it in 1991 uh, when it opened up with Steve, uh, uh, Steve Winwood. And then we had the pageant, which I was partners with Joe Edwards and helped develop that, design that, and also uh, book that. And that came online uh, in 2000. And we're gonna talk about the factory, which will be coming online uh, this year. So uh, by us becoming the major promoter in the market, not only here, but in the Midwest, uh, and agents like Frank Barcelona, who was the godfather of the agency rock business uh, in New York, he gave us our start. We booked Yes for two nights at the Old Keel. Uh, they hadn't sold out one night anywhere in the country, and Frank Barcelona really appreciated what we had done, selling 20,000 tickets. Poco was the opening act. Not a great uh, opening act for that particular show, but a great act nonetheless. And that was our break. Everybody needs a break. So in 1972, premier talent Frank Barcelona gave us our break. He gave us St. Louis and Kansas City, which became uh, of many other cities. Matter of fact, in comedy, uh, we promoted Jerry Seinfeld to all his dates in the world. So we took him to uh, London and France and Australia. Uh, so we had a big comedy division, which nobody in the country really had with uh, acts like Louis Anderson and uh, 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 Seinfeld, I mentioned, we started Tim Allen's career. We invented the Kings of Comedy uh, with Cedric, Bernie Mac, and uh, D.L. Hoodley, and then Steve Harvey joined on. So St. Louis became a major market uh, in the country for artists. So now 
because we have great venues and with the factory coming online even better, uh, most acts come here. You know, you're probably holding your Rolling Stones tickets from last June and they're probably, you won't see them this year, but we'll probably see them next year. So the long and short of it, the 30 years that Contemporary was Contemporary, the original Contemporary, we held the position of one of the top markets in the country. Pageant was in the top 20 clubs, maybe top 10, uh, Brian. And the Riverport was always in the top five amphitheaters. So just like we have the number one zoo in the country, we had a major a major venues then in St. Louis and we were ranked in the, in the high numbers. So that's how we got started. And then 1998, as it was said, it was 30 years in, we got an offer we couldn't refuse and uh, uh, a roll up by uh, the name of uh, um, SFX Entertainment bought us, a guy out of New York, Bob Sellerman, that was sold to Clear Channel, that was sold to Live Nations. So technically Live Nation owns what was Contemporary Productions and all the other 11, 12 companies that we owned at the time. So that's in my allowed time, a, a snapshot of why St. Louis is now a major market for concerts, for Broadway, uh, with two great theaters, the Fox and the Muni. And I'm glad to see both of them are coming back online very soon. Uh, we are a major market and we have major players. Dan Merker has worked for other companies around the country and has come on board as of last July to be uh, with Contemporary as our, as our talent buyer, specifically for the factory, which we'll talk about a little later. Well, thank you very much for that summary. Um, you know, you mentioned that you restarted the uh, iteration of Contemporary in 2000. My question is, why did you continue to keep the company here in St. Louis? Why not? <laughs> I mean, there's no reason not to. St. Louis is where I grew up. My office is on Hanley Road. I went to high school on Hanley Road at New City High. I went to college at UMSL, which if you go to Natural Bridge, you'll be at UMSL. So I've lived in this little bubble uh, for 72 years. My family's here, all my sons from other marriages and my daughters that are young. And uh, we love the people here. We love what St. Louis has done. I mean, we have a, our, our organizations, our symphony, our zoo. It's a great place, as everybody says, to raise a family. Uh, we do have a place out in California. We go uh, occasionally, not for long, but, you know, it's a great center of the country to get wherever you want to go. And, uh, you know, do I talk about architecture? I mean, pick a subject to talk about schools, architecture, museums, we have it all. I mean, we have we have some of those problems that people have as well in communities like, you know, what goes on, but we got great venues and we have, and there's great people here. And I don't have any reason to live anywhere else, nor do I plan to. And nor do I plan to retire. I sold the company, I was 50. So that was 22 years ago. And we're still producing hundred events a year for great organizations and great companies. Uh, that have been mentioned already in town, out of town, around the world. And uh, I got my band. I can't believe the band. I've been there a long time. So we like St. We like St. Louis. My, her family, Katie's family's here. And all the people working on the factory, although Michael's not originally Steinberg from St. Louis, he's from Omaha. He's made this his home for 30 years. Uh, Brian Carp came back to St. Louis. Dan Merker's from St. Louis. And, uh, and Jeff's a St. Louis, and not originally, but has been here most of his life. So we, we love St. Louis, and I could spend the next hour and a half just talking about why. Well, as a St. Louis native, I have to say I'm incredibly grateful to have you here and everything you've done for this city. So without further ado, let's get into the factory. So Steve, did you want to give us an overview about the factory? Well, the factory came about, I mean, I, I did the pageant in 2000. And the reason for the pageant is we had the Westport Playhouse, 1,000 seats in Westport. We had the American Theater, 1,600 seats downtown on 9th Street. And then we had the Fox and the other venues that are still existing. And Mississippi Nights was another one. So I went to Joe Edwards. Uh, we had lunch at Blueberry Hill. I said, Joe, you have you know your small place, the duck room. But if we don't do something around the 1,500 to 2,000 capacity, House of Blues is coming to St. Louis. There's no doubt. We already had Planet Hollywood, although it failed on the landing. And we had uh, Hard Rock, which I'm not sure is still around either. So we knew House of Blues was coming. I didn't realize Brian was working there at the time because I didn't know Brian. I knew his family. So we built the pageant with 2,000 seats, open floor seating, can-do chairs, great stage, great sight lines. And it was, it's been successful for over 20 years. Um, so there, you know, it, it just made sense uh, that all this would come about and, and everything did. And that's how it all came together. So talking to Mike Steinberg about when he announced he was buying Topman, taking over Topman, which, you know, when there was two malls, one was going to fail, Simon won, Topman lost. 
Uh, so I said to Michael, why don't we do something in the entertainment area? And I was thinking it could be a, a club uh, with music, you know, like a, a, the social house or whatever's out at Westport. It could be a 500 seater, 700 seater like Delmar Hall. It could be 2000 seats. And so, as soon as he said, let's think about it, I started my research and realized that the sweet spot was around 3000. 2000 is too small, 4000 is the Fox. We needed something in the 3000 range. Then you look at in Chesterfield, now you have a whole other audience to play to because you're playing to the West as opposed to just the East for downtown locations. So it came about really from, the, from just a conversation with my old friend, Michael, and Michael bit into it in a big way. And you're gonna hear about that. And that's why the factory is the factory. I think you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you for that. Did you want to talk a little bit more about the team members that you pulled together to uh, make this project happen? Well, the leader of the team is, uh, is Michael Steinberg because this is his project and uh, we're in the district and the district has other things that I think Brian's going to talk about. Uh, Brian came to both of us, to Michael and to me, about three years ago when he moved back to St. Louis. And uh, I didn't even realize that. And I was sitting in California thinking about the factory because I'd already spoken to Michael about it around the same time Brian returned. So I said, Brian, I want to see you in my office uh, the next day I was coming home. And uh, I hired Brian and uh, he consulted to Michael, but he was on our payroll and Michael's actually at the same time. Uh, and Merker, I didn't know Merker. Merker came to me through Brian and Jeff. Uh, we had no other people to interview but him because he filled the bill so well uh, being that he worked for Outback Concerts, he was a promoter. The, the best talent buyer to me, uh, no offense to Jeff, because Jeff was a, was a manager of an act, but a, a promoter that bu buys talent is, is very sensitive to the cost and to the deal. And Dan has done both, and he knows a lot about the business, uh, and he was the perfect fit. We, we have the dream team. I mean, Michael's let us do almost anything we want with the factory and then beyond. I mean, everything we've asked for we have and that's why it will be entertainment venue of the year once we can get open so we have a, a fantastic team and then brian may talk about some of the other people that are being hired to to, to work for him directly great all right brian i'm going to let you take it away and start talking a little bit about our location great thank you all for joining us today um the factory as steve mentioned is located just west of Top Golf at the Boone's Crossing exit off of Highway 40. Well, I call it Highway 40. I know it's Highway 64 now. Um, a lot has changed in the time that I was gone from St. Louis. And we're redeveloping that entire area to be an entertainment destination. So all the way from Top Golf on the on the east side to the factory on the west side, the entire Topman property is being redeveloped into a location called the District. One of the other anchors that we have secured is Main Event. Main Event is a family fun center, um, a competitor to Dave and Buster's, but they have a lot more offerings. They have a ropes course, they have bowling, and some of the other uses that we're looking at really all factor around entertainment. So we're looking at a bar restaurant concept that would have outdoor beach volleyball. We're looking at concepts that may include pickleball, um, we potentially will be building and operating a comedy club. There's talks of escape rooms, indoor mini golf, go-karts, anything that kind of surrounds the entertainment feel along with food and beverage. So there will be four to six mid to upper level restaurants, um, nothing that will compete with the location across in, in Chesterfield Commons um, that has a lot of the, the normal offerings that Michael also owns the properties over there. And eventually once Chesterfield Mall is redeveloped into the new downtown Chesterfield model, um, the density is going to really increase out West. And this entertainment destination, unlike anywhere else in the country, um, has everything all in one place. So we envision a, a day where you drop your kids off at the main event, you go over to Top Golf and hit some balls, everybody joins for dinner back at one of the restaurants um, and then attends an event over at the factory. So really a one-stop shop, you park once, you can have an entire experience, really isn't anything like that in the St. Louis community or in any communities across the country. As, as most places, Top Golf will be in one location, main events in another, and the concert venues in a third. So really bringing all of these concepts together 
um, under one roof or in one location is really going to be a, a boon for the area and, and draw from all over, as Steve mentioned, not only the, the St. Louis communities, but into St. Peter's and St. Charles and Wentzville. And we even feel that we'll be drawing some from Columbia um, for college kids that want to come up for concerts. That's the kids' experience. My experience for right now is I'm going to Annie Gunn's, then I'm going to the concert, and then I'm going to Lit, which is a cigar club that's open, has already been open next to us. So that'd be my experience. Yeah. Brian, did you want to talk a little bit about the venue and the capacity? Definitely. One of the great things about the factory is our versatility. Um, and uh, what we've really done is built this venue not only to accommodate concerts, but to be able to accommodate all different types of events from banquets to galas, to product launches, speeches, holiday parties, and really left no stone unturned when it came to designing the facility to be able to support all those different types of events. So our traditional capacity is 3000. That's a thousand, just over a thousand seated in the balcony and general admission standing room only of around 2000 downstairs. We can fully seat the facility and have just over 2,100 capacity. Or if we leave part of the area as general admission, we get upwards of 2,350. Um, we can do just the lower area downstairs. We have some movable partition walls in the back of the room that allow us, if we don't sell the balcony and enclose the back of the room, to shrink to just over 1,500 capacity, where we really become a standing room only club. Um, and we can scale it down and just do the lower balcony or the upper balcony, um, but have all sorts of different flexibility, which allows us to stage on sales. So we can see how on sales are going and grow the room with that. We can do smaller emerging bands without the band walking out and feeling like the room is half empty. And for corporate private events or any type of a rental, we can really create the look and the feel and the capacity that that client may need for their event. Um, so that, that, that ability to, to be everything um, without having a ton of labor involved in those changes really makes us uh, a special place to be and sets us apart from a lot of the other facilities in the country. The next slide is our plan views. So the downstairs, um, there's an admin building on the west side of the facility that houses our offices that will operate the venue out of the backstage facilities and dressing rooms for the bands. We have a dedicated catering room, which has an outdoor deck, um, four loading docks, makes it very easy in and out. And it's a 10 foot direct push onto the stage. So it saves a lot on labor on that. We have bus parking for three buses in the back, which has shore power um, and all sorts of different amenities that, that we think that separate us. Um, in those four dressing rooms, each one has its own bathroom and shower. We've created a crew lounge, which allows a space for the band's crew to go to during the day without having to feel like they have to stay on the bus. We have laundry facilities for them to be able to do their laundry, um, which is nice when you're on the road for six to eight weeks and really wanna give that hotel feel to the, to the experience of the bands that are coming in because it's very important for us not only to be the best opportunity and the best experience for the fan and the patron that comes through, we also need to give that to the bands and the entertainers as well. And the second one is our balcony view. Um, some of the things that you can see that we did there is we created um, angled sections on the sides of the balcony so that you're facing the stage as opposed to facing the, the group of people across from you in the theater. We put an extra step between each row so that you're a little bit higher above, um, which is helpful for people like me that are a little bit vertically challenged. And we also put in larger seats. So a traditional seat is, a, is an 18 inch seat. The front row in the balcony is a 23 inch seat and the remaining seats in the balcony are 20 to 22 inches. And they're really good chairs. I mean, if you've ever been to the Sheldon, it's wonderful acoustically. That's a very, you have to bring a, a seat cushion with you. That's <laughs> hard seats. These seats are so comfortable, you don't want to get up. I'll attest to that. When I did the virtual construction tour, I did touch the seats. <laughs> yeah. And I mentioned a lot of those artist amenities, uh, the dressing rooms, the, we have a private production office, um, the dedicated care, uh, catering area, secure parking in the loading dock area, and the great thing about this is when you come in for a private event, all of these spaces are part of the rental. So 
you can use them for small breakout rooms. You can use them for logistics offices. You can use them for spaces to be able to get away and take a phone call or do different things. We can create one as a bridal suite, um, different things that we can do that really allow us to, again, show the versatility of the space. And you're seeing some of the renderings, um, the view from the stage towards the seats and the view from the balcony seats towards the stage really gives you that perspective of, uh, of the design of the venue. Welcome to The Factory. The Factory is the first built from the ground up music venue in the Midwest in over 20 years. The brand new 52,000 square feet facility is designed specifically for live performances with every detail considered for the artist and the audience. The open and spacious interior takes its cues from old factories and manufacturing plants with appointments like weathered wood, metalwork stairs, exposed brick, industrial lighting fixture, and polished concrete. The factory is located off I-64 within the District Entertainment Complex in Chesterfield, Missouri, home to over a half million people within 10 miles. For guests, seven high-capacity bars reduce lines and wait times. Every seat has a commanding view of the large 60-foot stage. The factory has a 3,000-person capacity, but with its distinctive movable partitions, different seating configurations can be created, ranging from 2,350-person seated shows to 610 person seated dinners to intimate gatherings of any size. This is our crew dressing room that has two sets of bathrooms with showers as well as two sets of laundry facilities for the babies. For performers, amenities include five dressing rooms, private production office, catering room with outdoor deck, stage level load-in, four loading docks, and space for three tour buses. two of the dressing rooms that combine the movable wall so we can increase it into one larger space. Um, and each of these has their own bathroom and shower as well. This is the upstairs lobby, um, with a high capacity bar out here.
we'll see you at the factory where music is made. I hope you all enjoyed the, the tour. You probably didn't enjoy it as much as I did. I got to experience it in person, but we're hopeful this will, will all change soon. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start off with Brian. How does the factory as an entertainment venue compare with other entertainment venues around the country? Well, in our research, we found that this is the first ground up music venue build in the Midwest in the last 40 years. So we've really taken something where we were able to go around the country and take the best bits and pieces of every venue that we visited. So the angled balcony was taken from Brooklyn Steel. The upper balcony areas was taken from the Anthem in DC. Even things as subtle as not being able to see the stage from the bar so that it forces people to walk away from the bar after they've purchased their drink were little bits and pieces that have come into play through my operations of venues over the last 15 years from Dan and Steve and Jeff's experience in the industry. And what we really were able to do was to take all of this and, and choose the best qualities that we had seen or reverse engineer a lot of problems that exist in theaters um, and create what we think is a very unique experience for both the guests and the fans and a very easy venue to operate or much easier than a lot of the retrofitted venues um, or silent movie theaters from the 20s that have been converted into music venues today. That, in addition to being in a property that all works together, that all flows, that has the visibility of, of, the, of the millions of people that visit Top Golf, that has restaurants at, on the location to eat before and after the show, um, to have these other ancillary uses where people are driving by and seeing our, our beautiful electronic sign that we have out in front of the venue that are getting informed about upcoming shows makes this a very unique property. And Michael Steinberg has really gone above and beyond in allowing us to put all of these features and, and different things into the build um, that is go, really gonna allow this, as Steve mentioned, to be what we, we feel is one of the best venues in the country. Right. And if any of you feel any need to jump in and elaborate on any of these answers, please feel free. Um, but I, I would love to move more local. We have several music venues in town, the Chesterfield Amphitheater, Enterprise Center, to the Steeple Theater and Delmar Hall. How does this venue fit into that mix? And do we have enough capacity in our community for another venue? Jeff, did you want to take sure. this Sure. Uh, I mean, I think this was a good segue from what Brian said into this, but you know, there's always room for, for new venues when they're programmed correctly and when they're designed with the, the ultimate guest experience in mind. And we think we have that, you know, in the factory, combining the experience and, and the entertainment and the amenities and the enthusiasm that we all have. We think that this is going to be really the perfect place. You know, there's, there's bands that start out and they play smaller venues like Blueberry Hill and Del Mar Hall. They'll eventually get to us. Then there's bands that play the amphitheaters and the arenas. You know, right now, coming out of the pandemic, we're going to probably experience some underplays. Bands would normally play in a 10,000 seat arena, but they're going to do a couple nights at, at our at the factory because of the capacities and kind of uh, the state of the world right now. So we can capture everybody up and coming acts and, and legacy acts. Um, and so we think it's just a, the perfect fit. Combine that with a lot of the things that Brian has talked about, the free parking you know, the, the thought and the detail for Uber lines and, and Lyft lines and, and kind of the way that we're moving people in and out of the building, we think it's, it's going to be unparalleled in, in, in the community. Great. We have a question that came into the chat. And just to reiterate, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. We'll make sure we do our best to answer all questions that come in. Uh, David Chasson, thank you for your question. He asked who are the various design team member companies and the construction companies that worked on this project? I'd be happy well, to answer that. Okay, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, so the, the architect actually was brought on by Steve Shankman in Contemporary. Um, it's Abe Sesteda out of Houston. And Abe is responsible for Riverport Amphitheater as well as 20 other amphitheaters across the country. So he was a, a very skilled and knowledgeable person to have helping us design this facility. Um, the exteriors were designed by Chiadini, uh, which is a local architect company here that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. Keystone Construction was brought on for their familiarity with working in the Chesterfield market. And they are doing uh, the, gen the GC on the project. And O'Toole Design um, with Debbie Stamer leading the way um, really did a lot for us on the interior design and the finishes of the facility. 
Patty Gauss asked, was there an acoustician? I said that wrong. On the team. Acoustics expert. Acoustics expert. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, we started off working with a company um, called Wrights and Johnson Haddon and Williams, um, and then it ended up engaging our local partner Logic Systems and Chip Self, um, who's doing the install of the lights and sound. And he was very knowledgeable and helpful in helping us ensure that all of the suggestions that were brought forth by uh, Wrights and Johnson were implemented into the plan. Not only do we have acoustics in the in the house itself and in the theater. But if you noticed in, when we did the fly through and the, the, the unbelievable video you put together, you put the new and the old and the live and the recorded together, you'll see we have acoustic treatment in all the lobby areas as well to cut down on the noise. So it's really well thought out for the entire venue. Well, now that we're talking a little bit more about the details in the venue, Brian, I would love it if you could talk about any of these special considerations and requirements of the building uh, that you guys took had in mind as you were going through the designs? One of the things that was really important for us was, you know, as Steve said, the, the sound and the way that the sound moves around the venue. So there are several instances of newer materials, you know, the old fabric panels um, that, that have been used for sound mitigation for years and years. There are a lot of substitutes in that. So we have, we have the use of perforated metal on the walls in more high traffic areas where some of those fabrics may be torn. We have materials near the stage that have the appearance of wood. Um, those similar materials are being used in the lobbies that have a wood look to them, but are really sound mitigating materials. And then fabric um, that really looks almost artistic in a way um, over the portals in the balcony in each of the lobbies that adds not only an acoustical factor to it, but also a design element as well. So some those are some of the things that have been really kind of in, interesting in, in being able to use those those new materials to, to get us all to that same place where we have great sound in the facility. The other thing was going above and beyond um, on the HVAC. So this was planned prior to COVID, um, making sure that you know, we're recirculating air, there are CO2 monitors inside the venue that once CO2 hits a certain level, it recirculates air throughout the building. Mm -hmm. We've added ionization filters um, onto that, which allows us to bring less fresh air into the building, but keep it as a very clean building and a very well ventilated building. Um, and added additional of those once COVID started because we began construction about three weeks before the pandemic hit. So we were able to plan for a lot of these things prior to COVID happening that really fit into a lot of the things that had to be retrofitted in a lot of these theaters and, and venues um, once COVID became you know, our, our lives and, and working to reopen in this environment. Oh, that lovely word that we're all so familiar with, COVID. So speaking of COVID, how has the events of this past year impacted your progress or decision-making? How have those, changes, how have those, those decisions changed and do you see um, these changes being permanent in the, in the foreseeable future? For us, um, you know, we're delayed a little bit on our opening. We had anticipated opening May 1st. We now hope to open in this summer. And so we are a little behind, but we have been very fortunate that we've been building throughout this as opposed to the majority of the industry, which has been furloughed or sidelined for the last you know, 16 months. Um, it's really been something that we're looking as a benefit to us to be able to get up and running in a positive way when the when live returns and when the industry turns back on. Um, and some of these things that you'll see, the webcasting, the, the events like Steve and Contemporary have put together for the zoo that's coming up tomorrow night, those are going to continue for the foreseeable future. And we've even implemented some things into the factory's design where we are wired and completely ready to webcast simultaneously with concerts that may be going on if we have to open to more limited capacities. But our hope is with the vaccines and everything moving forward that by the time we get to the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, that we'll be able to have full capacity events again and everybody can start to enjoy themselves and get out of the house and, and enjoy live music and sporting events and different things that, that this city has to offer. Great, thank you, Brian. Let's move over to Dan. Um, talking a little bit about our national trends, do you see, what are those national trends that you see in the entertainment business um, that we should be looking for in St. Louis? I mean, I'd say the biggest one would just be the role of so, that social media now plays um, in music. 
and how people access music, you know, like growing up, a lot of us either went to a music shop or a record store and listened to a new album, bought it, and you'd listen to that album for weeks at a time. Now people discover new music and an artist will go viral from a simple TikTok video yeah. and that nobody's heard of that act, hear this song pops and next thing you know, they're selling 1500 tickets. They have no radio play. They're their social media assets are developing, but one simple, silly little TikTok video just hooked people and the act went viral. So, you know, that shift in social media has just played a, a huge role, not just in how people access music, but also how we advertise. Um, you know, the traditional outlets of, you know, firing out, out print or hanging posters on, you know, windows of other entertainment spaces or buying radio or TV and hoping it hits a certain demographic you want to uh, sell a ticket to or a little bit different now. You know, now we can go into something like Spotify and pull up a specific artist, uh, copy their audience pool and then run targeted digital ads directly to that artist's audience pool to try and sell a ticket to them. So things now are very much data driven um, and that's changing, which helps us analyze the return on our marketing dollar more um, and also helps us expand our bookings um, where we may be able to take risk on a lot more in hopes, in hopes of selling tickets uh, because we have data to back that up. So we talked about uh, national marketing. I'm curious, what marketing strategies do you have to get the people from the city outside of West County to attend events at the factory in Chesterfield? All digital. I mean, we can target us, us you know, if we want to target a specific area of the city. I mean, you can do that by zip code. You can do that by a region. I mean, you know, male, female, you can target ads by household income. I mean, you narrow it all down by a number of parameters, uh, specifically by where they're located now. And I also think that the program for the room is going to do. Oh. Well, while he's trying to get back on, here's the thing. Just like Riverport, when I built that in 1991 at the cost of $11 million, which in today's dollars would be double that, uh, we had no idea we were gonna get 20,000 people. There wasn't a venue in town really that held 20,000 in front of stage. I mean, the, you know, well, the dome, but you know, that's for football more than concerts. I mean, the enterprise center, you know, in front of stage is only, you know, 13, 14,000, the rest is behind. Yeah. So it's the same thing here. We're putting something in the right area with the right exposure, better exposure than anywhere. Even Riverport's exposure from Highway 70 doesn't exist. It's really from Mercy Expressway. Highway exposure in Chesterfield, safe area, free parking, other things around it. I mean, hotels, restaurants, companies, parks, trails. I mean, it has the beautiful Monarch Levee. If you go there on a Sunday morning, there's 400 people getting on that levee, you know, they'll either bike, ride, or walk. So location, location, location. In addition to now we face St. Charles, we face Wentzville, O'Fallon, Columbia, Wright City, Kansas City. I mean, if the right show is playing St. Louis or it's a show that you're just crazy about and you want to see it in two cities, it's, it's three and a half hours. People will travel an hour easily. I mean, if you live in St. Charles and you went downtown, by the time you got there and found a place to park and got inside to your seat, you're going to spend as much time as pulling up to the front of our place. So location, uh, we love the demo in that area, but if you live South St. Louis, North St. Louis, or going south down to Arnold, down to Cape Girardeau, and you have the right show or the genre of music you like, country, rock, pop, hip hop, kids shows on weekends and matinees, you're coming and it's easy to find. As soon as you say Top Golf, we have the second most visited Top Golf in the nation. Uh, only one other Top Golf draws more people. And with that signage, especially at night, up on the highway, it's an incredible place to get to and easy to get to, easy access, whether you're on Highway 40 or on Highway 64. Whichever one you want to take, it's the same. You're going to get there, you're going to get there quick. I'm in Clayton, it's less than 20 minutes for me to get out there. 
It looks like we've got Jeff back. Did you want to take the stage, Jeff? Is he on? I think he's back. I thought I let him in the room. Well, he usually picks up his, his little boy and he's probably in his car. So why don't you move on? If he comes back on, that'd be great. All right. Well, while we are waiting for him to get, oh. I'm back. Sorry, there my computer are. crashed. So my bad. So oh, it's technology. We're all learning it, aren't we? Yeah. Did you want to elaborate a little bit more on what Steve was talking about? Um, I kind of came in through the back half of it. So why don't we just move forward and then I can pick up where, uh, pick up on the conversation a little bit later. Great. Okay. So we were kind of talking about how Chesterfield is the right location. Um, I would love to hear why Chesterfield is the right location for an entertainment district when we just saw a relatively new outlet mall. Um, happen to be converted pretty quickly after its development well we're not selling clothing and tennis shoes you know people go to concert venues to see what they want to see but the more accessibility uh to a concert venue the more you're going to see them and that's why we think chesterfield is the right place i mean the amphitheater there has done very well uh with the, with the cutback amount of concerts they've done uh but i think whenever you can be on an interstate uh, close to so many different uh areas in St. Louis, even downtown or North City. Right. Uh, I, I think you I think it's a it's a home run. Great. Jeff, moving into a fun part of the conversation, I was wondering if you could discuss some of the genres you intend to feature at the factory. And I appreciate you not asking which artists because we <laughs> have to be confidential about that. So we before we make our big announcement with a lot of shows. So we won't get into specific artists, but you know it, it's a it's a cop out to say a little bit of everything, but that's really our goal. You know, I think you know we're a music venue first, so we're going to see a lot of rock and roll, classic rock, indie rock. There's going to be hip hop. Uh, we think the country market is a bit underserved in St. Louis for some of the shows that are around 3,000 capacity. So a lot of country music, uh, metal, jazz, blues, dance music, uh, but it's not just about um, national artists, we're going to really uh, foster local acts. You know, there'll be support for shows, and there's a handful of, of artists around here that, you know, have made a career for themselves, or else they do really well on a local level. We'll see programming for, for them in here. Um, kids shows, we think it's important, especially in the Chesterfield market. Speakers, comedians, live podcasts, uh, and then we have an entire, you know, you know, arm dedicated to events. So corporate events, weddings, receptions, private parties, all of those things, lectures. Um, so we really see a well-rounded uh, venue and, and we think we'll do a, a couple, we'll be busy a couple hundred nights a year, which we're really excited about. I know you also talked, uh, or Brian briefly discussed how it's gonna be open up to almost like personal events as well. Can you talk a little bit more about the types of events you can host at the factory? other than concerts? Well, there's really nothing we can't host. Like Brian yeah. said, we have 600 uh, capacity for tables and chairs, like a banquet. Now the pageant, once again, that was Joe and, and Steve and Pat Hagen. They're the two of those guys from Mississippi Nights, Pat and Joe from Blueberry Hill. They're in the beer business. Well, we are too, but I don't like the rails. So we don't have any rails. So we have side rails. So the floor <laughs> is completely flat. So we can have a uh, seating like you would have in a ballroom at the Ritz Carlton or the Four Seasons or other hotels or banquet centers, because I think it's important to have a venue in West County that can host, uh, uh, whether it's a charity gala or your company's putting on an event or you want a, a, an expo, we can have the catering all set up behind those movable walls that Brian mentioned. And when you're done with your meeting or your event, those walls open up and there's the buffet lines. So the flexibility was the biggest key when Steinberg and Shankman got together. We got to be able to do everything for everybody. I can't have 10,000 people. Okay. I can't, there's some things I, I can't bring the outdoors in, but there's more glass on the front of this building than I've seen in any uh, theater around anywhere. I mean, this is not a black box. This is a, I feel more like a Brian to like the Thompson hotels. When I walk in artwork on the walls, really beautiful furniture. The bathrooms are nicer than most people have in their own homes with all the materials, things I can't even pronounce, but uh, and, and the access to the bathrooms. We have more bathroom space than any other venue in town. Capacity in the bathroom needs to be large so people are back having a cocktail and seeing the show. And, and, and we've done that at the, at the factory. But really, 
There's so many things we could do. We could we may have a show, a comedy show, then we'll have chairs on the floor. So we'll have, so they'll be seated like any other show would be. Uh, again, GA shows where people just are on the floor, but it's a flat floor, so you're not on levels. Uh, so and then you have that great standing room area, which you saw in the video. We can use it for standing room. We could seat it. We can put buffets in it. Uh, lots of uses there. And then Brian didn't get around to mentioning, but we have I forget 54 seat 400 four tops. Oh, wow. Um, in the back of the room, we've got 34 tops in the back of the room. Okay, so I would have been wrong on both court. So yeah, four tops, high rise tables. And, and so people want to sit with their friends close to the bar and elevate it. I can't wait to see the first show in there to see the, how many compliments we get about everything, including smoking decks. I mean, instead of people leaving the building and stamped out and treated like, you know what, we have these beautiful smoking decks that overlook uh, the, the interstate, see the planes coming into the private airport and, and things moving and going on. So you feel like you're in a whole new space. Uh, and the entrance, we have so many entrance queue lines uh, to get in and parking right in front. Uh, it's just one good thing after another. And people we've brought through other promoters, other venue owners, uh, radio station executives and, and, and employees. They, even those that look for something that's not right, they have a hard time finding it. Matter of fact, We've never received any, we've received a couple of small ideas, but nothing of any large. And, and as far as catering, the best caterers in St. Louis will be available to cater events there. We have our own in-house catering and that's for the artists. And, and what nobody has said yet, it's so important that your venue serves the artists. I saw what happened with Riverport, game room, great uh, uh, dressing rooms, uh, law, we had a laundry, never forget James Taylor in the afternoon doing his laundry back in the laundromat that we had. So with basketball, I shot baskets, believe it or not, with Snoop Dogg. I guess you probably know who won that game. <laughs> the, the, the point of the matter is, is that if the artists like it, they talk to everybody on the road. Everybody talks to everybody, especially in the country community, because they're all together in Nashville and they'll be sitting around going, have you played the factory yet? So not only do you have to make your, your patron and your concert goer happy with all the acoustics and, and, the, and the bars and bathrooms and easy access, but you really have to make the acts like your place. And that will happen here as it did at the Riverport. Well, I love that you started talking about artist amenities and just trying to bring the draw to St. Louis. Dan, I'd love to hear um, just an elaboration on these artist amenities. I know Brian briefly talked about them during the presentation, but just some unique perspective and anybody else wanted to chime in as well. I think this is a pretty great selling point of Yeah, the I mean, Brian talked, touched on a good bit of it, but I mean, Really, at the end of the day, we want to make everyone with the tour and crew and the artists feel at home. And that starts with the semi truck drivers, you know, pulling into a fenced in lot and having shore power for the buses and walking in, having their own space to do laundry, you know, separate crew dressing rooms um, away from the artists. So everyone has their own personal space either to, to relax. Or to work you know a lot of people think that like life on the road can be quite glamorous and tour buses are fun but uh when you're on the cruise side and you're jammed in a bus and you know it's it's eight to twelve people that you might just be meeting for the you know the first time and here you are on the road for six months together it's pretty tight quarters um so to give everyone stay you know space backstage and really make them feel like they'd be, you know, in their office or living room at their own house uh, goes a long way in one, the reputation for the venue, but also in that crew um, and the artists wanting to come back to the venue. Um, the fan experience in the venue, I, I think, will be one of the best in the area. Um, and with, with that great fan, elevated fan experience, the artists feel that on stage. Um, and when they feel that energy from the fans, you know, it fuels them to put on the best show. Um, and people want to travel to see, to have the best fan experience. And artists want to play the best venues. So I think with that, with all the fine details and thought that have gone into this venue, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll really be, putting on some special shows in St. Louis and bringing in more people from outside of the city to come see concerts in St. Louis. Great, thank you. Uh, Perling on that previous, previous question, you mentioned the fan experience is gonna be uncomparable to any other. 
do you foresee the events from the last year signaling, signaling any uh, permanent changes to the concerts going forward, specifically to lower capacities, continued social distancing, and for structure upgrades, for increased ventilations, et cetera? I'll take that one. Um, you know, what we'll do is we will work alongside the CDC, St. Louis County, mm -hmm. and all the regulations that exist and make sure that we're providing a safe environment for everyone to come and enjoy themselves and to perform. So we will present plans to the county for approval that will allow us at today's 50% capacity, at increased capacities, and at full capacities to be able to put these events on. So we, we feel that as we move towards you know, the normalcy that, that hopefully will exist as we get toward the summer and the fall, that we'll be in a good place to be able to provide that safe experience for everybody coming into the venue. Great. Well, people, people are going back to concerts. I, I would say younger people will be there tomorrow uh, as they get a little bit older for or, or, uh, those type of shows. Some people will wait till late. I mean, the whole thing is vaccinations. If people are vaccinated, I've seen the difference myself in the last month. As more people get vaccinated, people feel a lot more like going out to restaurants. We've had a couple of new restaurants open here in Clayton at the Ritz and then Tony's across the street. And I, I, I think we have to be careful. And, but I mean, even in my kid's school, now it's three feet away with their mask as opposed to six feet. So they've cut the, 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 the space. So I think if everything goes well, I think things will come back quick. The pent up demand to go anywhere is huge. And I think once we put our first announcement out there, hopefully late spring, early summer, tickets will sell very quickly. People are a little afraid. If we put shows up right now, people are afraid to buy tickets because they've seen so many rescheduled. I mean, right now, if you go on the internet, you see a lot of shows in St. Louis. Some of those shows are gonna be pushed back again, probably, especially the early summer or late spring. But we wanna wait till we can, it's like people wanting to wait till we can be full capacity. We'd like to wait to at least see that the shows will stick Dan's got over 100 offers out there, including shows as early as the mid, mid July. But we don't want to put them out there until we know it's going to stick. The same thing with capacity. We don't want to put out 50% capacity. We can wait and do 100%. So it's all it's really what we keep saying. There's two things that start with a C that we're waiting for, capacity and content. Mm -hmm. if the content's not available, which means the tours are on the road. The next not going to go from LA to go to St. Louis and go to uh, uh, New York. They're going to have to go 300 mile, 500 mile stretches. So until there's tours, and they're starting to mount tours, so we see a lot of hope there, and and capacity. Until if the city opens up 100 percent, and the Fox can have 4,000 people in November for their first show, or the Muni can have 10,000 people in July, which they're advertising, so be it. But we have to go by the county, uh, uh, what the county says. But our own county executive has been out to see the factory, and others from the county have been there. So we hope to have a very good opening. I can't tell you the date. We'd love to tell you the date, and we'd love to tell you the first 10 shows because I have an idea what they're going to be, in, and I'm excited, very excited. I am excited, too. Uh, you started talking about on the road, and ironically, we had a question about parking. Uh, Kim Bullock asked, how will traffic be controlled, and as there appears to be only one way in and out? So that is correct. There is only one way in, although there are several opportunities to get back on the highway coming out. Um, we've created a new entrance that is at the very west end of the district that will allow us to move people into the parking areas west of the district as they first enter um, or the first ones that arrive. And that will be controlled by an off-duty um, Chesterfield police officer who will allow people to make that left into the parking lot and be cognizant of people coming the other direction, leaving the district or leaving Top Golf. Mm -hmm. We have over 900 dedicated spots for the venue. Uh, there are no there are no parking structures, so everybody's on a flat surface, which makes things a lot easier on the on the exit. And one of the abilities that we have on the exit is those lights run free at Boone's Crossing. So when there aren't people coming towards the district in the factory at 11 o'clock at night when we're all leaving, those lights will most, most likely stay green for long stretches. And if there is a backup, we can send people that are westbound on 6440 down to the next entrance, um, which allows that to run a little bit freer um, as people exit. So. Our hope is with those mitigations that are involved, mm -hmm. as well as potentially with phase two of the district coming online and some of the restaurants staying open after the show, it will allow us to slowly get everybody back on the road 
Um, and at the factory, we won't, you know, you know, if it's a country show, we're not going to blast hip hop and force everybody out immediately. It'll be a nice, soft, easy exit that'll allow people to finish their cocktails, to have a conversation, to talk about the show um, and really enjoy themselves as they move towards their cars and start to head home. Great. Um, all right. So now talking about the surrounding area, Brian, this question is for you. Will there be any other ancillary development surrounding this venue? Yes. So in the district, as we kind of talked about at the beginning, the idea is to have a lot of entertainment destinations as well as restaurants that will be located there. So in addition to everything on our property, you have everything at Chesterfield Commons across the street. Um, and then once Chesterfield Mall is redeveloped, there will be all sorts of offerings in that area as well. So the entire valley is really getting a, a facelift, um, which isn't necessarily needed. I mean, the Chesterfield Commons is, is one of the most active shopping centers in the country. Um, you have terrific restaurants like Annie Gunn's out in, in the Valley as well. So we really see this as elevating the experience for the people of Chesterfield and the people in West County um, and adding to what already exists out there to make it an even better location um, and with a lot different offerings for everyone. Has there been any special considerations or requirements of building in Chesterfield or attributes unique to this particular location? The only really special thing that we had to keep in mind was the proximity to the airport. So we were only allowed to go to 60 feet um, with the building. All of our up lighting has to be approved so that we're not interfering with any planes or, or anybody coming in and out of the, out of the um, spirit. Spirit Airport, um, but they've been great to work with. The FAA has been great to work with. We had initially planned a groundbreaking last spring, which had to be canceled because of the pandemic, but we were even going to have the ability to shoot fireworks off at that event. So um, the Chesterfield community has really embraced this idea. They've embraced the renovation of the, of the district and embraced the idea of having a music entertainment venue in their, in their city. Um, and have just been really thoughtful in, in helping us. We had our, our fire alarm test this morning with Monarch Fire, and they were all smiles and high fives when everything worked. So it's been a really good community effort to get this building uh, moving towards an opening. Great, thank you. Um, my next question, I'd really like to open it to the entire panel. Um, has there been anything really unique about the architecture and construction or any complex challenges that you had to work through in order to get the building open or approved? Take it, Brian. Um, you know, it was really just those restrictions on height and, and how to do that and, and maximize the space inside the venue. We really wanted to fill the, the square footage that we had um, allotted to us and still provide adequate parking for everyone. We at the district have a six to one parking ratio. Um, which is pretty unheard of for an entertainment or a shopping district. Um, but and, and elements like the Uber Lyft pickup drop off area um, have been really important in the design, making sure that the back dock area is not only usable space, but that it is convenient for the bands to get in and out of that it's a secure location, um, working with the city of Chesterfield and making sure that the front of the building is secured with bollards for the people that are standing out in front of the venue are protected while they're waiting to come in. Um, all of those considerations that were important prior to COVID were still implemented in this plan. Um, but as far as unique design, it's, it's really on the interiors and the finishes that I think sets us apart from a lot of the other venues. As Steve mentioned, the, the beautiful glass in the front of the building lets in a ton of natural light. Um, there's stone that was individual pieces of stone that were set around the elevator shaft that goes all the way to the roof. Uh, the concrete floors, the thin brick, thin set brick that's on the walls, even the, the industrial looking lighting fixtures and a special chandelier that we were having created by an artist out of California um, are really going to set the factory apart. Um, so not necessarily the construction elements of the design, but the interior and finishes elements have, have really been unique. Um, and I think we'll, we'll make for a terrific experience for everybody visiting the venue. Great. Steve, I know you said there was a little trouble trying to get that signed. Did you want to elaborate a little bit on that one? Well, it's not, there's just never been an electric sign in that area. And we had to go obviously to get, you know, arrangements made. I mean, you have a lot of construction people on, 
uh, it's no different than when I had Finale in Clayton, the club that was at Clayton on the park. I mean, I went to Clayton to the board and I said, unless I can put what shows I, I have coming up, we're on the second floor of the, of the hotel and we were able to get it approved. They just didn't want me to put steak dinner $4.99 and, and, and we're not gonna use our sign out in Chesterfield to do that kind of advertising either, but we will advertise the other uh, venues out there, Top Golf and, and, and uh, the main event, I mean, and, uh, and, the, and the factories uh, line up with shows. And, and it's, it's just necessary to do what we're doing. We're not a movie theater where a movie's here for a month. We get one, two, maybe three nights and we have a three night at the same show and then it changes to the next show. So uh, I think Chesterfield has been great to work with as was Maryland Heights, as was Clayton, uh, as was U City. I've never had a problem uh, when I've been involved with, with good partners uh, like I were in all these areas, uh, getting these types of things done. We ask for things that are necessary we don't ask for things that we really don't need. Well, driving down that that highway almost daily, I have to say that that sign made a huge difference. You cannot miss it. No, it's bright and it's and it's informative and it's quick, so you don't have to it, stare at it. Absolutely, it is bright. Uh, we have another question come in. Will um, or when do they hope to move into phase two of development, and are those team members already determined? So phase two will start um, once the retail is vacated. So Polo and Coach and H&M are vacating their spaces. Polo and H&M are moving down to the Simon property. So their buildings are getting fitted out right now. Um, and once those changes happen, it really allows us to move into phase two to do some additions, some subtractions of some buildings, some renovations of some buildings and allow those partners to be selected as you can imagine, the restaurants are a little bit slow to talk about um, expansion at this time, but we have a lot of, of good opportunities. A lot of people have reached out um, both locally and nationally that have concepts that maybe have one location downtown or one location in a different city that are looking to expand that see the value of being next to the factory and next to um, Top Golf. And so we really see about probably a 12 to 18 month lag before phase two um, is up and running. Oh, I totally understand that. Just seeing the hit that the hospitality market has taken. Um, another question came in, will multifamily development be included in future phases of this district or this area? So the district will not have any um, housing. So the district is completely going to be um, entertainment focused and food and beverage focused. Um, I have not seen the official master plan for the Chesterfield Mall redevelopment, but I know there is some talk of density in um, in in living um, in that location, but I'm not involved in that intimately enough to speak to that. Okay, and just so everyone knows, I just have a few more questions, so I am opening it up to the audience. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat. Uh, Thomas from Development Strategies asked, will there be a pedestrian pathway across Highway 40 to the shopping restaurants to the south? And if so, will they be dedicated right away? I don't know that that has been discussed. Um, it's something that we can definitely bring up to the development team. Um, but we we see this as being a one 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 time parking for each side of the highway. So if you want to visit, you know, the south side of the highway and the Chesterfield Commons, you will need to repark when you come over to the district or vice versa. Um, so I don't know that there will be anything that that goes across, but that is a, a very interesting idea. Okay. Well, great. That was Thomas from Development Strategies if you'd like to connect afterwards. <laughs> All right, Patty Goss from Goss Acoustics, uh, she asked, is there a different design team for the next phase? Um, currently, um, there, there is, it has been undecided as to who's going to be doing that. So main event um, did select um, Keystone to do the shell of the building, and then they brought in their own team to do the fit out and, and the interiors. Um, and I would imagine that that'll be a similar structure um, for other opportunities and other developments that, that end up coming into the space. So I think everybody has the ability to work with Keystone if they'd like to, but I don't think there, there are restrictions if they want to utilize other construction companies or other developers to fit out their space and create their environment for, for their patrons. Great. Another question, do you have expansion plans for regional or national areas for the, uh, a similar tech facility? 
well, it's not out of the question, but we got to get this first one open first. But knowing Michael Steinberg and knowing all the other properties that he has a part in, uh, you know, coast to coast, I would, and he likes entertainment, I would think that there's a possibility based on the success of the factory. And, and if we were going to be open May 1st and tickets would have gone on sale a month ago, right. the success would be a reality. It's all been delayed because of the pandemic, us and everything else. So I, I don't think that's out of the question. Would you agree with that, guys? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we've identified some other opportunities in other cities. That's always something that we're forward thinking on. But Steve's right. The, the number one priority right now is getting the factory open, is getting the factory established in the industry. Uh, but the team that we have is more than capable of operating several venues and booking several venues and developing several venues. So we hope as the industry comes back that there will be more opportunity for us in other cities as well. Yeah, at our height, contemporary managed, own managed, or leased uh, close to 10 venues across the country. So we were, wow. in St. Louis was the Westport, the American Theater, uh, the Pageant, Riverport, uh, and then out of town, we had Sandstone Amphitheater in Kansas City. So yeah, we have, a, and, and we have a great team, but uh, it's like anything else. We've got to find the right markets. I think I love Nashville, but that's just me personally, and Dan's down there. Uh, because the artists are so accessible and the people are so nice down there. But let's let's get let's get going on this one, and then we start looking at other things a year from now. Great. Another thing um, I would just love for you to talk about, Steve, is when we were rehearsing through this yesterday. You mentioned just learning from prior projects the best way to design this one, and that was something related to the stage. I would love you love for you to ever, uh, elaborate more on that. Well, I took over the Westport Playhouse after three other operators failed. It was a thousand seats in the round and the acts used to run around on the turntable. I mean, literally you'd see Bachman Turner Overdrive going around at a slow speed, but still. Now there was advantages because you got to see the drummer hitting the bass pedal, you know, and, and there was advantages because there were only 10 rows of seats because it was in the round. But again, I would never build that. The American Theater is exactly what Brian was talking to. We took a 1930 year old, a 1930s built venue and try to make it into a concert hall by taking the seats out and building risers. So um, what's great about the factory is like the VIP seats that we sold are in the first two rows of the balcony. The balcony is so comfortable and it's so close to the stage. It's a great place to sit. I mean, per personally, when I saw Sting at the pageant, I sat in the second row of the balcony because I don't really want to be on the floor looking over people's heads and, and trying to find a good way to, to see the show. So the balcony is very close. The size is, as Brian said, the way they're angled off, you're looking straight at really at the stage. Uh, there's not a bad seat. There's not one obstructed seat. We've been through that before. I had Finale, which I mentioned, and it was built in a space where we had four poles. So somebody had to be behind the pole. It's just no way around it. So I, I, I think what we have here is, is, is the best that you can possibly ask for. Uh, and so we don't have those restrictions that we've had in other, in other venues. Even Riverport, and, and Abe's designed it, there were parts where if you were on the hill and you were behind one of those blue poles that kept the structure up, you didn't like it. Well, you would always see those became the aisles. So, I mean, this is perfection uh, from the standpoint of, of, of all the things you need weren't there before. You created them as you, as you started. Like you said, the height of the building. We don't need to go any higher. So, so that restriction really didn't impend us at all. Matter of fact, none of the restrictions were in our way because everything we did was, was the ground up. And what's gonna be fun for the bands, a lot of them travel with bicycles. You got that Monarch levee right there. You'll see the crew and, and the guys from bands and motorcycles and some fly private. So they'll come right into spirit. Things just keep adding up a why this is, it's like, there's nothing wrong until you get open. Then you may find something that you'll have to change. Uh, but I don't see much of that based on our history of, you know, lots of years of seeing lots of places. Did I, I answer your question? That, I, I, that was exactly what I wanted you to say. Okay. I, that that I was remember. interesting to me yesterday. I didn't remember, I didn't remember the rehearsal, but I know it was good. You mentioned it and I was like, oh, that was interesting. Just learning from all of the experience you had in your past and how you were able to make this perfect structure um, for a concert. So. Well, we got we we got to still mention Michael. But this was Michael's building. Oh, yeah. This is Michael's venue. This is Michael's district. But the fact that we're all partnered with him in different respects, you know, the three people that are on here, 
uh, Brian is, is the COO, and that he listens and he's listened to us from day one is so amazing when you get a client that listens to what you have to say. And, and you know, he's a, he's a control guy. I mean, why wouldn't he be? He runs a big company, but he loves this place. And, and, and I know why he wanted to build it. And, and I'm glad he did the size we did. And when it came to the, the, the look of the place and the acoustics, the construction, although he picked uh, all the uh, subs and the GC, you pick good people. I mean, th this place is ready in two weeks. Uh, and we'll have some private events and they were already talking to three or four groups yeah. for some smaller private events. Uh, and, and we're pushing Dan and, and Jeff hard as we can, but they're waiting on the industry to open up. Live Nation and AEG aren't having any easier time than we are. Oh. If it's available to them, it's available to us. Great. Well, I am opening it up to our audience. Does anyone have any other further questions for our panelists while we have our experts on the line? And while we're thinking for a few more questions, I wanted to also ask our panelists, is there any other, any other uh, notes worth mentioning about this, this factory and the, the development that you feel is necessary to discuss on this call? Did we hit on everything? All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any further questions. We are getting close to five. Um, so with that, I'll start the closing. I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody, for attending. I really appreciate you guys staying active in SNPS. I know it's been so hard in a virtual environment trying to stay active and involved. Um, Zoom fatigue is a very real thing. So I appreciate everybody for joining this call today. And a special thanks to our panelists. Without you, we are not able to host extraordinary events like this and learn more about our city and the great things that are going on here. So again, a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us and I look forward to seeing you all at our next events. Thanks everyone.